Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about the fact that we hear with our eyes that classical music is a visual medium. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because we've had conversations about things like Yuja Wang's dresses and Klaus Mekela being a matinee idol type and all that. And really, when you think about it, none of that should make any difference because all we should be listening to is what they do, the music they produce, which is an auditory phenomenon. I mean, we really wouldn't know listening to them blind if they were young or old or good looking or ugly or any of those things. But these are massively important factors in their careers and in the way that we approach them. And that pisses me beyond belief. It really does because I'm a purist. I'm, I'm unreasonably a purist. And I understand that. I really believe that music ought to be music, something that we spend our our ears listening to that we you know experience completely through hearing because i think hearing is an underused sense i mean really when you think about it even going to a concert we go to symphony concerts and i'd love to go to symphony concerts they're wonderful we have a great time and you have a great time because we don't say we go to hear the new york philharmonic you say i'm going to see the new york philharmonic and of course that's true I always want balcony seats. I always want to be on top. I always want to see what the orchestra is doing. Uh, and, and that's a large part of the thrill of going to a concert. It really is. I mean, the fact that you can actually watch and make the connection between what people are doing and what you're hearing. I mean, that entertains you far more than just being able to listen, as for example, on a recording. I always was shocked, really shocked, that you know people would want to watch videos of concerts on youtube for example or when laser discs started coming in all that and i like this and i said to myself who wants to see these people i mean they're not really all that interesting looking and 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 the, and the videography almost always sucks it drives me crazy because when you go to a concert yourself you decide what you're going to follow and what you're going to look at. But to have to watch someone else telling you, especially all those horrible close-ups. You know, the orchestra is going crazy. You want to see what they're all doing. And meanwhile, you're looking down like the nose of the trumpet player or the, the bore of the, you know, oboe. Or I don't know. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. But uh, there are people who do. And I, I have to respect that. I mean, the visual element matters tremendously. It, it, it's a function of everything that we do. And let's not kid ourselves. It's a function of a lot of music, a lot of music that we listen to. Composers took advantage of the visual element. I made a little list below of visual music, visual, more or less abstract music, music that's, you know, not really, it, it's not, well, some of it's more abstract than others. There's, there's some program music here too. But, you know, composers sometimes do, what do you want? Come here, Mildred. Mildred wants to play. It's, it's, it's time for her morning fetch. That's it. Go that way. Composers sometimes want to control even the visual aspect of performance. And it's kind of fascinating when they do. I, I have here, what's these seven quick examples that we could talk about. First is Haydn's Farewell Symphony. I mean, the visual is built into that work because all the players gradually leave as the performance goes on. And Haydn was counting on the fact that his prince would see the players going away as the piece finally slowly evaporates at the very end. It's a, it was a joke, of course. It was a comic, a comic gesture, but a, a brilliantly theatrical one. And it's, it's something that's always been a part and parcel of our musical experience. I mean, a, a programmatic version of that is Beethoven was Wellington's Victory, where I, if you read the preface to Wellington's Victory, it's very, very specific about where the instruments have to be placed and how they line up and how the forces are assembled because you've got opposing forces having a battle. And so they stand at opposite ends at the, of the proscenium and they try and blast each other to smithereens. And, you know, and Beethoven, you know, was always very sensitive about those things, about, you know, the perception that his music made. But to exercise that volume of control over the actual performance space was really kind of kind of different, I think, for its time in an, in an orchestral work anyway. 
I mean, you have something similar in Liszt's Faust Symphony. And the Faust Symphony, um, as some of you may know, if you do the version with the chorus at the end, there's nobody on stage singing, um, at least initially. What happens is that, you know, the orchestra simmers down and all of a sudden Liszt indicates, you know, the the doors to the sides of the stage fly open and white-robed acolytes come streaming onto the stage, singing all is fair gang. You know, they're singing the final chorus, Mysticus, from Goethe's Faust. And I mean, it's a wonderfully theatrical moment and sometimes an, an, an unintentionally comic one. The first time I saw it, I was like, what? What the hell is that? And they're like, you know, walking around back there. Um, I saw a performance when I was in college with the Baltimore Symphony under Sergio Comissiona. And he, they did exactly what Liszt asked, and it was really completely ineffective. But, you know, there you go. Uh, you know, that was, that, was, that was the concept anyway. And uh, he, he dictated very specifically what's going to happen. There are even some, some you know, sort of small scale, shall we say, visual effects. Mahler is a master of visual effects in his symphonies, the first symphony. The very end of the first symphony, when the, the horns are blasting out the tune and Mahler says, all the horns, stand up. And boy, if they do it, the audience just goes, wow, look at that. Oh, baby, that's really, really cool. I'm in Mahler's second symphony. You know, there's a moment where, and it's a different moment every time because Mahler doesn't really spe specify what it is, but the chorus enters usually sitting down and then only stands up at the very end. Um, you know, to blast out their resurrection ode. And there's all kinds of things like that in Mahler symphonies with on stage and off stage and people walking on and off and around and doing stuff. You know, that kind of, you know, exploitation of the, of the actual acoustic space, the performance space, and uh, adds a, a visual element to the performance, which is lost on recordings, and to be honest. And even if you prefer recordings, and I sort of do actually at this point in my career, um, you, you, you don't want to lose out of that visual element because it's thrilling. It really is. It's just thrilling. I remember in Strauss's Alpine Symphony, there's a moment, there was a moment when I saw the New York Philharmonic do it under Zubin Mehta, where the cowbells, you know, the herd of sheep, when you're going through the Alpine Meadows, sort of wanders across the back of the stage. And this, this guy with a pile of cowbells clanging along sort of walked around. It was a Chris Lamb, I think, you know, from the New York Philharmonic Percussion Section. He's walking around ringing his little cowbells. He was the herd of sheep. And that was also kind of humorous. But with Strauss, the humor was probably intentional. Um, if you go past that, look at Nielsen's Fourth Symphony, the inextinguishable, where you have two sets of timpani, one placed at the front of the stage and one at the back on the other side, and they're slogging it out to try and crush each other. I mean, that's an, an abstract iteration of the literal battle that we find in Beethoven's Wellington's Victory. And it's incredibly exciting to watch. It really is. I, again, I, the first time I saw it, I was with a friend who really didn't know anything about classical music or I used to I used to you know, subscribe to the uh, to a series of Carnegie Hall and the Philharmonic, and then try and bring friends of mine from work who were not familiar with classical music, and then gauge their reactions. It was really fun to do, and they had a great time. I mean, we all had fun. But the first time, the first time this friend of mine saw Nielsen's Fourth, he was just dazzled by the the, the, the thrilling theatricality of the whole thing and that visual element. It, it's 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 absolutely riveting. Uh, Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and celesta is another one of those pieces where you know Bartok is controlling the entire performance space because you have antiphonal string orchestras, two of them, one on the left, one on the right, with the percussion and the piano in the middle. And if you look at the score, he gives you a seating diagram. He tells you exactly where everyone is supposed to sit in order to perform the piece, so that so that in this case. The, the visual element clarifies the musical argument, the interchanges between these three performance components. And then last on my little list, which you can see down below, I just wrote it down for you, is, is George Crumb, Vox Balané, his voice of the whale for three masked singers. I mean, with, I mean, they're masked, they wear masks. Why do they wear masks? I don't know, but they do. Um, and it's, it's certainly an element of the performance of the piece that they, they are anonymous. I mean, the idea of having the voice of the whale being 
something that which is entirely this mysterious thing emerging from the anonymity of the various players. There, of course, the fascinating thing is that he's using he's using the visual element to actually negate what we normally see, which is the personalities of the actual performers. Um, it, it's a fascinating phenomenon. It really is. And, and so it permeates everything that we do in our experience of the music. You know, the way we, the way we take it in and the way we respond to it. And I get it. I, I really do. But I don't like it. I really don't like it. It seems somehow cheap to me and, and wrong. And, and I mean, not in a live performance, of course not. Because if you're going to go to a live performance, performers, you know, composers sometimes feel, well, I mean, you know, you have to come and experience it in person. And so I can control everything that the audience is going to see, including the visual aspect of the music. And I get that because they're doing that to support the message of the music. I mean, that's okay. It's okay. But, uh, but what bothers me isn't that performers sometimes do this or that, or that composers write this into their music. What bothers me about it is that it detracts from the fact that we ought to be spending most of our, our time and effort and energy in the auditory element, in the audible element, in listening, in letting our ears do the experiencing. And really, a lot of us don't have confidence in our ability to just hear to get all of the entertainment or emotional or expressive information we need simply through listening. I mean, when MTV started, that was a biggie. I remember when MTV got started and I'm being a crank, you know, from my earliest days, I thought to myself, who the hell wants to see these things? Why would anyone want to see a video of a, a lousy song? You know, nine times out of ten, the songs are really simple and they have like no musical content whatsoever. And, and why would anyone want to watch that? Well, it turns out, of course, that they were brilliant because the visual element was far more interesting than the musical element. I mean, that's what you get. And perhaps the difference between popular music is in just a rock video or at least a rock video of a not terribly interesting rock song or popular song and a classical song is that even there, the, the, the hearing element is supposedly more important <laughs> than the visual element. I mean, at least that's what I hope. But, you know, when we talk about the obsession of the classical music industry with finding young audiences and young people and all of that stuff, it's, you know, they hire Klaus Mekela because he will attract young people. Well, he's not going to attract young people because, because of what he sounds like. He's attracting young people because of what he looks like. And that is not an entirely, well, you know, I, I made my point, right? You get it. We don't have to go into it any further. But I just wanted to throw this out there. The visual and classical music, it's a major thing. And I find it problematic because it's just too easy for our performance arts organizations and other people to obsess about the visual element at the expense of what matters, which is what you actually hear. That's my point. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me and take care.